John 19, 4 through 16. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no basis for charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for charges against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have no law. We have a law. According to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. Here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Good morning. My name is Chris Huffines. Uh, know your ears do not deceive you. I, I'm not Andrew. I'm not the normal preacher. Um, but he's taking a well-deserved break after Easter and, and should be back next week. Um, for those of you trying to put a face to the name, I have, my wife and I have two little girls. Colleen, who is uh, seven years old, is a brunette, has short hair. And then Antha, who's 11, who has uh, long blonde hair and usually wearing a cape. Uh, so those, those are our girls, and, and now you know who we are. Um, so today we're going to go ahead and, and talk about a little bit more on the Easter story, specifically about Pontius Pilate and his interactions with Jesus. And in fact, this sermon is titled, You Had One Job, Pontius Pilate. Um, so the story of Pilate shows up in all four Gospels. That uh, means it's probably pretty important. It's, it's a, all four Gospel writers felt a need to focus some of their limited time and space on interacting with Pilate. The most complete story is in John, and that was some of which we, we heard, uh, heard in the scripture. On the next slide, it shows that the two big points we're going to hit. Number one, just what happened. Uh, what happened in, in, with Pilate and Jesus. And specifically, uh, Pilate acted very indecisively. He acted in a way that tended to push the, the, the question or the decision off on other people. And then he finally chose to release Barabbas instead of Jesus. And these were very odd things for him to have done. So we're going to dig into that, what happened and why. And then the, the application, why should I care? Uh, we got to sit through 30 minutes of talking about this. What's the takeaway? And that's, we're going to talk about that. Let's move on to the next slide and talk first about Pilate. Uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, we don't know a whole lot about him. He is relatively invisible historically. Uh, in addition to the gospel, he shows up in Josephus and then a couple other places, um, mostly in relationship to the fact this Christian uh, faith that's growing. Uh, there's also one artifact with his name on it. That's really it. There's not a whole lot. But we do know he was a member of the Pontia Gens. A Gens was a Roman extended family or clan. Uh, think of it like a large political dynasty in this case. Uh, modern American politics, the Bushes, would be a good example. Um, and the, the Pontii were equestrians, so they were lower class nobility, uh, knights or barons maybe. Uh, and he was the, the governor of Judea. So uh, Pontius Pilate himself was almost certainly educated, uh, at least somewhat wealthy, well-connected, and almost certainly had been in the Roman military. Uh, you almost had to have those things to get this particular job. And this particular job was the governor, the governor general of Judea. And uh, he had really one, one job, and that was to keep the peace. Uh, and Judea itself was, was not terribly large or important, 
Uh, but it was a difficult job because of some historical, some geographic, and unfortunately some cultural uh, realities of, of working in Judea. Uh, when he was, while he was governor, he was relatively friendly with the Sadducees, and he worked well with them. We know that from Josephus, not from from Christian texts. And this is interesting: the the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes were the three large uh, religious slash political groups in Judea at the time. The Essenes were kind of hermits; they really don't show up in the scripture. We can we can safely ignore them for this discussion. Uh, the Sadducees were the party of the high priest, of the priesthood. They tended to be more cosmopolitan. They tended to be more pro-Greek, and they tended to be collaborators, if you will. Uh, whereas the Pharisees uh, were not necessarily priests. They tended really more to be educated lawyer types, uh, intellectuals. They also tended to be more conservative, more traditional, uh, more more pro-Jewish uh, rather than pro-Greek. And this Greek-Jewish divide is important. You see, uh, when Alexander the Great comes through in, I think, about 150 BC or so, conquers um, conquers the known world, in this case, from Greece all the way down to Egypt through Judea, he turns and, and conquers Iraq and Iran and eventually gets to India and dies. Um, he had this policy of Hellenization, of importing Greek culture into these conquests, including Judea. And one of the things that they would do is they would equate the gods of the Greek pantheon with the local gods. So we have a couple examples that show up in scripture. The first one is going to be uh, Artemis of the Ephesians uh, in in the book of Acts, uh, which is kind of interesting because Artemis herself is the the goddess of the hunt. The goddess of the moon is a a virgin goddess. Artemis of the Ephesians is a fertility goddess, which really doesn't mesh but that was the that was the hunter moon goddess in Ephesus. So Hellenization. Now this this goddess of her name was is actually we really think she's Artemis. Same thing in Judea. Well, Jehovah God is is the big god. He's the important one. He's the head. So he's got to be Zeus. And so we're going to go ahead and worship Jehovah as if he were Zeus and go ahead and raise statues of Zeus on the grounds of the temple. And that went about as bad as you might expect. Um, the, the Jews absolutely refused to, uh, to even pretend that this was okay. Uh, every time it even looked like something like this was going to happen, especially on the temple grounds, uh, there, would be, there would be some sort of unrest. A lot of times there were revolutions or, or riots. And so um, in, this, in this time period then, when the Romans come in, and the Romans adored Greek culture and art and history and religion. In fact, uh, at the time, if you're an upper-class Roman, if you're Pontius Pilate, for example, you speak Greek. You don't speak the vulgar, the Latin. You, you speak Greek. You dress in Greek. You do Greek art and Greek poetry and Greek drama. And so um, the fact that that Pilate worked well with the Sadducees isn't that unusual, but it is important when you start looking at the fact that a lot of these Messiah cults were themselves part of the more pharisaical, more pro-Jewish part of the culture, and where the idea of the Messiah is going to kick out the Romans comes in. One other thing to to point out, too, is that this divide, this this Greek-slash-Roman side versus the Jewish side, meant there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of, of tension in in the politics in the in Judea, uh, we had a lot of Messiah cults showing up. They there were some armed revolutions that happened that the Romans would have to put down, and they would they would crush them violently. Uh, you also had a lot of situations where you'd be walking down the street, walking through the market, and if you're a known collaborator, you're a known pro-Roman, you get knifed in the back, and your assailant just melts away into the crowd. And those were the zealots, the first terrorists. Um, and those were pro-Jewish terrorists. Um, so a lot of going on uh, for, for such an unimportant little province as Judea. Uh, the final thing to, to point out here is all during the, the story of the crucifixion is that Pilate's not on his home turf. He lived in Caesarea, which was a port town on the Mediterranean, uh, a pretty good distance north of Jerusalem. And so every time we see him in the scriptures, He's not on his home turf anymore. He's actually um, on the road, if you will. So when 
Jesus comes before Pilate, we have to think about what's been going on recently. We're in the third year of Jesus's ministry. Uh, we're about a week after the triumphal procession, and we have to assume that Pilate's not a complete idiot. So he's been paying attention to what's been going on. So he knows there's a Jesus out there. They, he knows people are saying he's the Messiah. And he knows that just a week ago, he came into town and there was just a massive, massive, uh, the triumphal procession happened. Uh, in other words, people were praising him as king, praising God, laying down their cloaks and laying down the palm branches to welcome him in. And that everybody's saying that he might just be the Messiah. And now he, re he is the Messiah and he, he fulfilled the prophecy coming into town. So Pilate's been kind of been paying some attention to who he is and what that means. Let's go to the next slide. Jesus, if he is the Messiah, it means some certain things, all of which are, have to be somewhat terrifying for Pilate. Um, the first one is that P Jesus, if he's the Messiah, he is the king. Now, Romans don't like kings. In fact, they, they generally kind of hate them. And it's just baked into Roman history. Uh, when the city, according to their own history, when the city was founded, there were some kings. And those kings became evil and corrupt and eventually were overthrown by the Senate, at which point Rome became a republic. And up until the, the present day, about 30, 33 AD, uh, Rome is officially a republic. And, um, and this is a, a very important part of the Roman national identity. They absolutely do not like the idea of a king being in charge of them. When Julius Caesar was assassinated uh, about 75, 80 years before, one of the reasons, the primary reason that was stated was because he had just been named dictator for life and they, that he was setting himself up to be a king and therefore he had to die. And even though we have now emperors, Augustus was the first and now Tiberius, the current emperor, uh, they never referred to themselves as emperor or as king or anything, anything that sounded like a hereditary, I am in charge monarchy. They would refer, them, refer to themselves as princeps or princeps civitas, a first citizen, or imperator, a military title that means the guy who gives the orders. They would never, ever refer to themselves as a king. Uh, if they did, they would be killed. And so the fact that Jesus is coming as a king is just going to set Pilate's teeth on edge at best. It may be even more of a threat. Second, it was the common knowledge or the common wisdom of, of the Judean on the street that the Messiah is going to kick out the Romans. He's going to start an armed revolution. He's going to be like a judge. You know, and all the judges' stories are the Jewish people are being oppressed. God raises up a judge. The judge does some ridiculous military victory, and the, and the, the oppressors are gone. And that's what they were thinking uh, every time they thought the Messiah. He's going to be, he's going to come in, he's going to kick out the Romans. And there were a lot of the anti-Romans and the anti-Greeks. Remember, we have the Sadducees and the Pharisees showing this cultural divide. One half of that divide would love nothing more than for the Romans to be gone forever and, and take all their Greek gods and Greek culture with them. Um, so there's just a ready-made source of manpower, of spies, of money, of, of warriors. They're all right there waiting for that spark to go up. And Jesus, if he's the Messiah, he's going to be that spark. And the final thing to think about is if this happens, then Jesus is going to be in charge of Judea. And Judea, for all of its unimportance, is in a very important strategic location. Let's go to the next slide, which shows a map of this part of the world at about 30, 33 AD. Uh, the red is going to be the Roman Empire. Uh, the, and then the pink is going to be Roman client states. Uh, and the reason that Rome has some client states right there are because of the brown, the Persian Empire. Uh, for thousands of years, uh, there's always going to be some, some Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire itself or the Byzantines after it. There's always going to be a Persian Empire. Uh, and there are always going to be two superpowers that are right next to each other, frequently going to war, always in competition. And at this time... Rome and Persia had these buffer states between them. You think about the Cold War, the U.S. and the USSR, and you had Western Europe and Eastern Europe as the buffer states, almost exactly the same thing going on here. And so at this time, you have Judea is really close to Rome, so you're really close to Persia. If something happens in Judea, Persia is going to be sticking its fingers in, trying to, to mess with things to their own advantage, or at least to Rome's disadvantage. 
Uh, maybe more importantly, if you're reading up on Jesus, if you have your spies going out, figuring out anything about this guy, and the miraculous birth story comes up, then you know about the Magi, these three kings that came into town, three or more kings, um, who did something to annoy Herod and then snuck out, which is really suspicious when you re- when you know that the Magi or the Magoi were a group in Persia whose job was to pick the king. So now you have these Persian kingmakers supposedly come into town, worship this Jesus guy as he's a baby, maybe select him as a king, and then sneak out before the loyal Roman client Herod can stop them. It's kind of a scary story uh, with, with regards to Persia. Just to make it worse, a little bit south of Judea is Egypt. Uh, at this time, the city of Rome is the largest city in the world. There's a million people in there, and the surrounding countryside cannot feed it. Rome must import grain in order for the people to not starve. And they import it from a lot from Greece and a lot from the area around Carthage, but most of it from the Nile Valley, from Egypt. So if anything gets too difficult or too too hot in Judea, and it spills over into Egypt, and that disrupts the grain supply, then Rome starves. And when Rome starves, the nearly a million peasants and freedmen in Rome will rise up and overthrow the government, and that would be a bad thing. And Pilate will take the blame for it, because it started on his watch and his territory. So he's got to be very, very touchy about the idea of a Jewish Messiah, especially one that's right in front of him on trial. And that's bad enough. That's Jesus's earthly power. Let's talk about his divine power on the next slide, because if you're paying attention to Jesus, then you know he has been doing miracles. And those miracles are, in, are themselves kind of scary if you're Pilate, because he can feed 5,000 people in, you know, in, in one go, actually 5,000 men plus more, maybe equal number of women and children, so 10,000 plus. Uh, that's a lot of people. That's a good-sized army right there. He can heal the sick and the injured. Well, if you're a, a warrior or a soldier in the ancient world, you might die of your wounds in battle. You are almost certainly more likely to die of sickness. But Jesus can cover both of those, wounded or sick or even dead, You know, because we now have Lazarus, then Jesus can heal you and keep you going. And if you're one of those crazy zealots, you're a ready-made army right there that can't be killed. That's, that's, again, terrifying. Jesus can command wind and weather. He can keep those grain ships from sailing out of, uh, out of Alexandria. He can drop mud, you know, rain and mud on your soldiers while his have dry ground. He can ruin crops. Um, and, and also, he, he can walk on water. Uh, if you look at the Roman Empire, there's one big thing in the middle of it, and that is the Mediterranean Sea. The Romans called that Mare Nostrum, uh, our sea, because all of their troop supply, all of their all of their uh, trade, anything of any size, uh, went over the Mediterranean by ship. And if you can walk on water, you can shut that down. If your loudmouth apostle Peter talks about how he got to walk on water too when Jesus just when he trusted in Jesus enough, just like those zealots really trust in in their own cause, then you suddenly realize an entire army might be walking on water, and the strategic benefit of that is simply incalculable. Uh, in other words, if you if you look at at Jesus as a miracle worker and have the right mindset, say a former military officer like Pilate was, you realize he has an army sitting right there that he can feed off of basically nothing that is larger than six legions, uh, than 4,800 men. And those people can't be killed, can't be stopped, and might be able to completely shut down uh, the very lifeblood of your empire. So if Jesus is half the miracle worker that he sounds like, the military advantage is going to be absolutely ridiculous. And there's one more piece of this, and that's on the next slide. It's that same map again, but we have a couple of uh, circles there with numbers, and those circles are the locations of those numbered legions, and there's only six of them in the area. There's only 25 legions or so in the entire Roman Empire, uh, 
And most of them are up in Germany fighting the Germans, uh, th those invading Germanic tribes. Uh, there's only six available. And if a revolution kicks off, historically what happened was the one in Judea doesn't last long at all. It's left to the five surrounding legions to try and hold the peace. And they succeeded in AD 70. Uh, but if the Persians stick their oar in, then six legions, five legions is really not enough. So again, it's, it's just a terrifying prospect to, to know that if Jesus decides to start a revolution, um, he has all this power and you have all this not very much to stop him with. But maybe even worse, on the next slide, is what the people were doing. Uh, we, we get to this, this mob scene where Pilate's trying to ask the people, what do you want? You know, should I actually crucify this guy? And the, 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 the mob shouts two interesting things. Uh, the first one is, you're no friend of Caesar. Now, we are talking earlier about how the gens are, are kind of these extended families, extended clans. They're also kind of like the mafia, where you're a friend of the family, at which point things go well, or you're not a friend of the family, you end up in the Tiber with, uh, with cement overshoes. And it was kind of the same thing here in, in Roman times. If you were a friend of the Caesars, you were a friend of the ruling class, uh, then that was good. But if you weren't, you were an enemy and you didn't last long. But for Pilate, it's a little bit worse. Uh, we talked earlier that the emperor now is Tiberius, the second emperor. And Tiberius is famous for he really didn't want to be emperor. Uh, and for most of his reign, he pawned off all this authority and day-to-day uh, -day work on this guy named Lucius Sejanus, who was a praetorian, a uh, secret service agent. And Sejanus uh, appointed all these government officials, including almost certainly Pilate. And, but in, in doing so and in running things, he made enough enemies that in AD 31, he was assassinated. And we're not quite sure when, uh, when Jesus was crucified. It might have been 29. It might have been 34. Uh, but either way, either Sejanus is on, on the way out, his power is waning and he's in trouble, or he's already been assassinated. And um, Tiberius has to take power back and actually rule for the last five years of his reign. So when this Jewish mob is yelling to Pilate, who had been, who had been, who'd patronized Sejanus and not necessarily Tiberius, you're no friend of Caesar, you're no friend of Tiberius, it's a much more direct threat because it's saying, you know, especially if he's already dead, just like Sejanus, you're not really on Caesar's side. It's not a good thing to hear if you're Pilate. But the other thing they say is, and they shout is, we have no king but Caesar. And let's remember, the Romans hated kings, and, and until really the 300s, the emperors did not identify themselves as kings or as emperors, anything that might possibly be construed as emperor. Um, so now the Jews, though, they're shouting, we don't have a king. The only king we have is Caesar. The only king we have is this guy whose job is not to identify himself as a king. Um, so this whole mob scene gets very out of hand very quickly, and that in of itself might start off a revolution, might get Pilate himself killed, because now the people he's in charge of are shouting treason like they shouldn't be doing. So what does Pilate do at this point? Uh, he, he really doesn't interact with the problem is the first thing. Instead, what he tries to do is he tries to pawn the decision off on somebody else. So he, he first he asks Jesus, are you really the king? They say you're a king. Are you a king? And it's really a trick question. Uh, it's a kind of a, have you stopped beating your wife kind of question. Uh, because if Jesus says, yes, I am, well, that's a revolution. You know, you're a traitor. I can, I can kill you. If he says no, then the Sadducees come in. They start bringing evidence and he, so he'll get tricked somehow or trapped somehow. And I'll kill him that way. He had a trial. But Jesus does the Jesus thing and just kind of throws the question back in a way that you really can't answer. And he says, well, you said it. You said I'm a king. Um, and so Pilate really doesn't get anywhere on, on this first this first tactic. So he tries plan B, and he tries to hand the decision off. At first, he sends it to Herod, because Herod, uh, this is, this is by the way, is the, the birth story Herod's um, descendant, uh, is in charge of Galilee, and Jesus is from Galilee. So send him that way. Herod, you go deal with it. And Herod hems and haws a bit and sends him back. He's not going to answer it. Um, and so then Pilate tries to get the people to make the decision. He says, you know, should I crucify him? I don't think he's guilty because remember, Jesus just had 
thousands of people lying in the streets. And he just told all of them that he didn't think Jesus was guilty. Um, he says, I don't think he's guilty. Should I, should I crucify him? And the people are, are shouting and shouting and crucify, crucify. Uh, you know, we have no king but Caesar. So that didn't work either. Um, and so finally, Pilate just takes the easy solution. Um, he finally decides that the best thing for him to do is just to kill this guy and get rid of him and treat him like any other Messiah pretender. And so Jesus is crucified. Um, but you'll notice at no point in the story does Pilate ever actually figure out if Jesus is guilty. Uh, all he knows is that the Sadducees accused him. The Sadducees clearly want him dead. Herod doesn't want to deal with him. Jesus doesn't want to doesn't want to play ball and argue with him. And the people want him dead because they've been whipped up into a mob. He never interacts with the justice of the decision. He never interacts with the right and wrong. It's just what's the easiest thing for Pilate. And that brings us to to the who cares? Why why should why should I care? Why does this matter to me? And this is on our last slide. Uh, and the first thing to, to, to think about is the fact that everything lined up. Uh, if you look at things like this, this king issue uh, with the Romans and the Greeks versus the Jews in, in the time period, and the Sadducees hated him, and the Pharisees weren't going to defend him because he made them look like idiots so many times, and the people are arguing, all of this comes out and all of this lined up making the crucifixion decision almost only the only option Pilate had. And this is important because it shows the power and the sovereignty of God, that God lined up this whole of human history to this point to make this one thing, this one sacrifice of his son happen exactly the right way. And um, it's actually, I think it's very comforting when things are going badly to look back and just see how much God makes things work how much he makes them line up in exactly the right way to make exactly the right outcome happen. That level of power is terrifying, but it also shows that God is good and God is king and that he is in charge, even when and it doesn't make sense to me, even when it doesn't make sense. Uh, when I think it's going to go badly. Uh, I do know that, that he's in charge and he's got this thing uh, moving the direction he wants it to move. And that's the first point. The second point is that everyone has has roles. They have a job in the plan. Uh, and I, I put plan in, in capitalization because I, I, if you look at the Bible, the Bible is the story of um, the very little bit at, at Genesis is, is God's doing a thing. And then, and then people mess it up. We sin in the Garden of Eden. And then everything up through Revelation is God moving everything back into place to finish off what he started in Genesis. And then the very tail end of revolution, a revelation is, all right, now we're back on, on the plan. Let's do that. Let's do the thing we're going to do. Um, and, and everyone has their role. Everyone has their jobs in this great work of getting all of humanity back on track with God. Um, and, and there, there's lots of them. We all have many roles. They're all big and small. Um, you know, just for me right now, I have a role as a husband, as a father, uh, for the next five minutes or so as a teacher uh, with this scripture and a sermon, I have a role as an employee. I have a role uh, to society in the quarantine, not go get people sick. I have a role to use my various talents uh, for the good of the kingdom. All these things come together, and we have all these jobs. And, um, and in the pilot story, everyone does their job, whether they want to or not, in Pilate's case. Um, you know, Jesus comes out there and he, he sees it through, uh, the, the, the role of sacrifice and redeemer. Uh, the Sadducees, their jobs whip up the mob and they very reliably provide that mob. Uh, Pilate's role is to execute Jesus even though he is blameless. And he does that because that's the one thing he says. I don't think he's guilty. Should I really execute him? And finally he does. And so you do have your role and you do have your job. And I just want to encourage you to, to do it, uh, to see what God has for you. And just to take that and run with it, because like I said, you've got a role in the plan and the plan is getting all of humanity back on track with God. And it's, it's a great thing to do. All right. Well, again, next week we'll have Andrew back and uh, looking forward to that. I'd like to go ahead and close us off with a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the blessings that you've poured out on us. Uh, in this season, it's easy to, to think of, of your son and the sacrifice that, that he did and, and the resurrection, the, the, the role where we can be 
uh, with you uh, through eternity, serving you and experiencing the original plan for humanity. God, we just thank you for uh, not just the big blessings, but also the little blessings, uh, you know, friends and family and the little bits of, of ease in, in what right now is a pretty hard time. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you, you be with us, keep us diligent and on task as we, we do fulfill our roles, as we do deal with, um, with current events, with sickness, with uh, disputes, and with, with danger. Lord, we just ask that you especially bless uh, those of us who are sick, uh, not just in our particular body, in our city, in our state, but throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.